السلام عليكم سور ثروت از ا سيلف ليميتنج كونديشن ذات ريزولفز سبونتينيوسلي ويزين ا ويك ايفن وذاوت انتيبايوتيك تريتمنت بات بي وير ذير ار سيرتن كونديشنز ذات هاف فيري سيميلر كلينيكال فيتشرز اوف كومن سور ثروت بات رانز ا ديفرنت كورس اند ريكوايرز ديفرنت مانجمنت امونغ ذيس از ذا انفكشس مونونوكليوزس glandular fever infectious mononucleosis got other names like glandular fever and fivers disease is a common acute and systemic viral infection it's in fact the most clinically relevant form of viral pharyngitis and is caused by epstein barr virus in more than 90% of the cases with a small contribution from other agents including for example cytomegalovirus the epstein barr virus is one of six human herpes viruses the human herpes virus number 4 and it can be isolated from the blood of the patient lymph nodes and their saliva and this is of course relevant because this is how the disease is transmitted it has a classical triad of symptoms sore throat and fever accompanied by a significant lymphadenopathy in the neck and elsewhere hence the name the glandular fever and it has a fairly long incubation period between 4 and 8 weeks infectious mononucleosis is primarily a disease of the young adults between the age of 15 and 25 or so but it can present in early childhood as well as in older age groups the incidence is quite high estimated at 500 new cases in every 100,000 persons per year and is transmitted by saliva and that's how it got its other name it's described as the kissing disease most of the adult population had already had a glandular fever either in the clinical or a subclinical form because most of the adult population have already antibody titers in their serum the course of the disease is usually for seven to ten days for the sore throat and the pharyngitis but lymphadenopathy can remain a bit longer up to two weeks and what's relevant is that malaise and fatigue could persist for a month or even more sometimes it usually starts with a prodroma of four or five days with malaise and fatigue and headaches followed by the triad of the disease the most common of which is tender cervical lymph nodes followed by fever and a sore throat from the pharyngitis the pharyngeal inflammation can cause um, a range of different manifestations uh, ranging from just acute follicular tonsillitis to a gray membrane over the tonsils and other parts of the pharynx including the, the nasopharyngeal lymphoid tissue and the base of the tongue lymphoid tissue as well the other features would include petechiae on the soft palate and in about 50 percent of the cases there may be some abdominal discomfort and tenderness due to splenomegaly and hepatomegaly infectious mononucleosis must be distinguished from the streptococcal tonsillitis the two conditions may have a fairly similar clinical features with some subtle differences sometimes among these differences is that in the infectious mononucleosis there is usually an exudative form of tonsillitis with grayish membrane over the tonsil and that grayish membrane may actually extend into other lymphoid tissue in the base of the tongue and can be seen on uh, nasoendoscopy over the uh, nasopharyngeal lymphoid pad which would which will be seen as uh, hypertrophied and covered with the whitish membrane the other feature is the lymphadenopathy in the neck is usually in the anterior part of the neck the jugulodigastric in the case of streptococcal uh, pharyngitis and tonsillitis in the uh, infectious mononucleosis it could affect the anterior and the posterior triangles of the neck as well and can sometimes also extend to other parts of the body the specific features of infectious mononucleosis would include things like splenomegaly and hepatomegaly and also a higher tendency to have an airway compromise and difficulty in breathing due to the florid hypertrophy of the lymphoid tissue but sometimes differentiation between the two conditions would rest on blood tests
among the other features of infectious mononucleosis is splenomegaly that can be detected in up to 50% of the patients. And this can be sinister because a rupture can follow, a splenic rupture can follow blunt uh, trauma to the abdomen or sometimes splenic infarcts. There may be also hepatomegaly and jaundice that can be seen between 5 and 10% of the cases. But what is more relevant is that liver function tests are usually abnormal, particularly transaminases. Enzymes are always elevated. And if the patient has been prescribed any ampicillin or ampicillin-based antibiotics, almost invariably they are going to develop a skin rash of maculopapular reddish rash. If a patient develops bilateral peritonsillar abscess, bilateral quinzes, this is almost diagnostic of infectious mononucleosis because it's very rare to happen with streptococcal or mixed or other mixed flora uh, peritonsillar abscesses. The hypertrophy of the lymphoid tissue in the valdized ring is also uh, quite significant. And as you can see here, there is such a florid enlargement of the tonsils and the postnasal space uh, lymphoid tissue, sometimes this can cause airway compromise and have to be uh, attended for either medically or surgically. The other less common and rare clinical signs of infectious mononucleosis includes periorbital edema in the eyelids. This is called the Hoogland sign. You could see the bilateral edema in the upper eyelids in this case. They may also present to his cranial nerves involvement, either mono or polo neuropathies. Facial nerve weakness is the most common, but other cranial nerves can be affected, including the hypoglossal, the oculomotor, and the vagus, either in isolation or in combination like a polyneuropathy. The differential diagnosis of the Epstein Barr infection includes of course the acute pharyngotonsillitis most commonly caused by the streptococcal infections but um, also other conditions like cytomegalovirus infection in fact the uh, classic infectious mononucleosis is usually caused by the epstein barr virus but uh, in maybe five to ten percent it can have an identical uh, clinical picture when it is caused by the cytomegalovirus other conditions include toxoplasmosis, particularly for uh, persons who uh, is of the habit of eating semi-cooked meat or dealing with animals, including cats, rubella with its classic rash and fever and sore throat, and even acute HIV infections. Blood tests. Three groups of blood tests can help in differentiating infectious mononucleosis from other similar conditions, including the simple a blood picture which would show a significant lymphocytosis with atypical lymphocytes. This may be uh, not very apparent in the first week, but should be very significant in the second. An absolute rise in the number of lymphocytes and a substantial rise in atypical lymphocytes as well. The second group of blood tests um, refers to hepatic enzymes and liver transaminases are almost always uniformly elevated in the case of the Epstein-Barr virus infection. The third group refers to immunoglobulins in the serum. As you can see from this chart, which reflects the serology profile from infectious mononucleosis, there will be little or no activity in the first part of the disease, including the incubation period and perhaps the prodroma as well. In the acute phase, there will be a rise of certain anti-immunoglobulins, including two immunoglobulins that are of importance in the diagnosis of the acute phase. One of them, this black one, is the heterophile antibody, which forms the basis for the pole panel test and the monospot test. As you can see, it starts to rise in the acute phase, peaks, and then drops back again after the acute phase. And the other is the immunoglobulin M, which also uh, starts to rise uh, early in the disease, but then subsides after a few weeks or so. But other immunoglobulins, immunoglobulin G, would uh, start to rise slowly during the acute phase, 
but will persist in recovery and even longer. And these are the types of immunoglobulins that would remain elevated in the serum of adults who have been exposed to the virus in the past. Um, the two immunoglobulins that are elevated only in the early part of the disease, the heterophyll antibodies and the immunoglobulin M are the basis for most of the tests to detect the Epstein -Barr virus infection. The clinical setting will be looking for a screening test that is available, not expensive, and would give results in the early phases of the disease rather than waiting for immunoglobulins, for example. Um, the lymphocyte count and lymphocyte to white blood count uh, ratio can provide such a test with certain limitations. As you can see, the difference between a classic uh, glandular fever blood test and the uh, tonsillitis with from streptococcal infection and other types of infection, you would see an elevated uh, white blood counts in both more marked with the streptococcal infection. At most of the streptococcal infection, elevation is due to neutrophil count rather than lymphocytes. Lymphocytes would be elevated more in the glandular fever group. And the ratio between the lymphocytes count and the white count uh, would be more than 50% in the glandular fever group and would be about 10% in the tonsillitis group. So it's a, a quick screening test to differentiate between the glandular fever and other forms of acute tonsillitis. Uh, a ratio more of lymphocytes to white cell count between 35 and 50% could indicate glandular fever. A large uh, retrospective analysis of more than 1,000 patients of confirmed infectious mononucleosis by immunoglobulins showed a sensitivity of about 70% and a bit higher specificity. So this is a useful test, but should be only used uh, to differentiate the infectious mononucleosis provided the other Hoogland criteria are uh, there and present. And these are the Hoogland criteria for uh, detection of the Epstein virus infection. In addition to the classic triad, of uh, fever, pharyngitis, and lymphadenopathy, the um, blood count would show 50% lymphocytes over total white blood count, and at least 10% atypical forms of lymphocytes in there. In addition, uh, it was proposed that the absolute lymphocytes count should be more than 4,000 in a millimeter square. This is its equivalent per liter. And in addition, of course, if this can be confirmed by a positive serological test. And now to the serological tests. The heterophyll antibody test has remained the basis for one of the most common diagnostic tests for infectious mononucleosis for almost 90 years or so. It was first introduced by Paul and Bunnell uh, as early as 90 years ago, who uh, discovered that the serum of the infected patients, when uh, mixed with the sheep erythrocytes, could cause the erythrocytes to agglutinate. And the monospot test, which is based on the same phenomena, uses bovine erythrocytes uh, extracted antigen rather than sheep erythrocytes to detect the heterophyll antibody. And the most common uh, uh, serological test today is based on this. It's a good screening test because the sensitivity and the specificity is uh, far from being perfect. And we'll see now examples of uh, false positive and false negative for it, but it remains a useful screening test. A monospot test would miss one out of every seven cases of true infectious mononucleosis. The reasons for these negative, false negative um, heterophyll antibody tests is this. The level of the heterophyll antibody starts to rise in the acute phase, but may not reach a threshold for, for few weeks. So in the first two weeks, only about 60% of the patients would have enough immunoglobulin, um, heterophyll immunoglobulin, to give a positive test. It will eventually rise up to a peak, and 90% of the young adults will become positive, 
but 10% would not. These are probably cases of infectious mononucleosis caused by other agents, not the Epstein Barr virus, like the cytomegalovirus, for example. The other thing is that it would rarely be positive for children below the age of five years. So all these are causes for a false negative monospot test. It can also give false positive results, even in healthy controls, in cases with mumps, systemic lupus, erythromatosis, Mediterranean fever, diabetes, and sarcoidosis. And the gold standard test would be based on immunoglobulin M. This would rise also early enough in the infection and would subside very quickly after the acute phase of the infection. It is uh, immunoglobulin M is antibodies towards a viral capsid antigen found during the acute primary infection by Epstein-Barr virus. The other tests that are less uh, used includes PCR real-time and measurements of the Epstein-Barr virus loads, and the, uh, this can help in the early diagnosis of infectious mononucleosis in case other tests, the serological tests, were inconclusive. The management in cases of infectious mononucleosis is primarily supportive and symptomatic. The illness would generally result within two weeks. It's important to avoid using any ampicillin-based antibiotics to avoid the florid maculopapular eruption. It's also very important to avoid any contact sports during the first four to six weeks, even in the absence of splenomegaly to uh, avoid the risk of splenic rupture. And in ch children, uh, they should avoid using aspirin as analgesics and antipyretics because of the fear of developing RISE syndrome, which is basically a disease of childhood and can cause encephalitis and fatty degeneration of certain viscera. The best analgesics would be paracetamol and ibuprofen plus rest and uh, ample fluids. Antiviral agents may be considered in the management of infectious mononucleosis, and acyclovir is the most commonly prescribed antiviral. Uh, in a meta-analysis of five randomized controlled trials of more than 300 patients who were treated with acyclovir, showed that um, the use of acyclovir is not justified for the treatment of mild to moderate uh, cases of infectious mononucleosis, no much uh, benefit. But if there is a severe form of the infection, especially when the patient uh, requires, for example, corticosteroids, and in the high-risk complication groups or prolonged uh, fatigue syndrome, then antiviral agent, the acyclovir, would be helpful in a dose between 600 and 8 100 milligrams orally a day, divided into five equal doses uh, for between seven and 10 days, or uh, 10 milligrams kilogram body weight intravenously, uh, eight hourly for seven days. Any role for corticosteroids in the management of infectious mononucleosis? A Cochrane review concluded that there is insufficient data to support the use of steroids routinely in all uh, for cases of infectious mononucleosis. It's indicated on perhaps most in cases who have uh, acute or pending upper airway obstruction, but not in the routine cases that would usually self-limit within two weeks. The role of corticosteroids in managing complications is also not very clear, uh, but there may be a role in immune-mediated anemia, thrombocytopenia, and interstitial nephritis. Prednisone, prednisolone, or dexamethasone may be used. Um, prednisone had been shown to uh, reduce the length of the illness, but the main um, action for the steroids is the management of complications of the infectious mononucleosis, uh, basically the airway obstruction, but also other immune-mediated forms of the disease, uh, including aseptic meningitis, myocarditis, pericarditis, and thrombocytopenia. Any role for surgery in the form of acute tonsillectomy in the acute phase to relieve upper airway obstruction. Only very few reports on fairly small uh, cohorts have been uh, published in the past. And the main 
lines of management for upper airway obstruction in cases of infectious mononucleosis include corticosteroids or emergency intubation or tracheostomy. But there are few reports of acute tonsillectomy, including this report on 25 patients. Uh, some of them were on steroids, uh, 15 and 10 were not, and the operation was done successfully, and there have been no uh, complications for the tonsillectomy, more than the usual complications of tonsillite, of tonsillectomy in the usual uh, setting. Uh, the authors suggested that it decreased the morbidity of recurrent tonsillitis after the infectious mononucleosis as well and relieved the upper airway obstruction. Another uh, small cohort of patients, 36 admissions of infectious mononucleosis over five years period in a single institute, and that um, these patients were treated initially with corticosteroids and did not respond well. And the authors uh, concluded that acute tonsillectomy is an appropriate treatment option for the subgroup of patients who have upper airway obstruction and their symptoms and cannot be controlled by corticosteroids. Sore throat and pharyngitis caused by the Epstein-Barr virus can run a very different course from the ordinary or the common sore throat pharyngitis uh, disorder. These complications should be in mind while planning follow-up and while advising patients. Patients can run into airway obstruction in about 5% of the cases, and the risk of splenic rupture is real. There is also the risk of hepatitis and jaundice in about 5% of the cases. Uh, several hematological problems, including autoimmune hemolytic anemia, thrombocytopenia, a plastic anemia, respiratory problems including pneumonitis and emphysema and even mediastinitis, several neurological problems including cranial nerve pulses, Guillain-Barré syndrome, meningoencephalitis, and gastrointestinal disorders including acute appendicitis and pseudo-acute appendicitis and mesenteric adenitis, also genital urinary problems with genital ulceration and interstitial nephritis and some cardiac risks as well including myocarditis, infective endocarditis and pericarditis. In addition, there are certain oncological risks of Epstein-Barr virus infection in the genome positive patient including lymphomas, uh, natural killer leukemia, Hodgkin's gastric carcinoma, lymphoproliferative disorders in the immunocompromised patient, and it's a cofactor in the development of nasopharyngeal carcinoma. And finally, the other risks and possible complications include the rather common chronic fatigue syndrome, which may affect as high as 20% of the patients up to six months after their glandular fever infection. This is in comparison to less than 5% of patients who have the usual upper respiratory tract infection and is characterized by poor physical functions. Uh, this is the main factor in the chronic fatigue syndrome. Other factors would include that uh, with a history of Epstein-Barr virus, uh, infection, the risk of developing multiple sclerosis is substantially increased. There's also uh, a causative role of the virus in the chronic active Epstein virus uh, infection syndrome and also conditions like hemophagocytic or lymphohistocytosis. By this, we come to the end of this presentation on sore throat Beware of the infectious mononucleosis, the glandular fever. Salam alaikum.